When I was first starting out, my fly fishing guru held up a fly and he said, Gribs, he's got this real deep voice, he said, Gribs, if you buy that in the store, it'll cost you two fifty. If you tie it yourself, it'll cost you twenty five cents. Several hundred dollars in fly tying materials later, I started to question this wisdom. And I took a class at my local fly shop about tying flies, just for fun. Because I already knew how to tie, because I have the best fly fishing guru in the world. And, uh, and the, the guy there who's like a salesman, right? Like he's trying to sell product. He said, don't let anyone tell you that you can save money by tying your own flies. Sure, in the long run, you will after you spend about two grand on materials and equipment. The most successful videos on my channel are called Dirt Cheap Fly Fishing. And they talk about how I decided not to use the traditional rod and reel combo, blah, 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 blah. The real reality of the situation is that I spent way more money on fly tying materials than I ever spent on a rod and reel. That's where the expense of this hobby is. So I started thinking, is there a way to reduce that barrier to entry? Is there a way that you could tie some very, very simple basic flies and still cover all your bases? Is there a way that if, I don't know, supply were limited by a global pandemic, you could fish the rest of the season tying very, very simple flies with very simple material and not spend a lot of money? So I think I have devised a way that you can get into the fly tying game and start saving money within your first 50 flies. Yes, there is investment. You need about a hundred bucks. You also need a thermos of hot coffee and a pipe with a flat base on it so it'll sit nicely on your desk when you're tying. Let's get started. So if you're new here, I am Gribbly and you are witnessing my ongoing folly. These are videos in which I go out in the woods and fail. So let's talk philosophy for a second, right? I think that the fly doesn't matter nearly as much as we think it does. Human beings are egotistical creatures and we like to think that it's the complexity of our creation and the beauty of the proportions and all that that trick fish into biting. I think fish will bite anything that looks like a bug. Now, yes, yes, there are times when fish wanna bite a really specific bug. And during those times, these combos of flies that I'm going to show you might not catch as many fish as realistic match-the-hatch style flies. I can live with that. I have spent so much money trying to catch every single fish in the river, and I realized that if I kept spending this money, I would still never catch every single fish in the river. So I am okay backing off a little bit. If you want to tie those tiny little match the hatch style flies, more power to you as long as you can get materials and you can afford it and you're a nerd. So I thought about this and I looked at my fly box and I came up with a way to tie my two most important, most effective flies uh, for really not much money at all. This is going to cost about a hundred bucks and for that money you could get online and probably buy 50 flies. I, I looked at a different couple of different websites. I priced it out. It looks like flies average about $2. Yes, you can get some cheaper, some are more expensive. So I just went with a $2 figure. So if you took a $100 bill and you went to discountflies.com, you'd come out with about 50 flies. We can tie 50 flies and get all the equipment for the same $100 bill. So in designing these flies, it's important to remember that we're trying to catch a broad range of fish in a broad range of situations. We are not going after the particular brook brown rainbow bass on the Upper East Fork of the Missoula Hobag. We're just catching fish. And it's also important to remember that we're not trying to tie a huge variety of sizes. Uh, you know, this rig that I'm about to show you will tie everything from like a, I don't know, I've never tied anything bigger than an eight down to a 22. If you need something, Outside of those ranges, you, this is probably not the video for you. So let's get started with the vice. So we got a hundred dollar budget, right? You could go out and spend four times that on a vice, and I'm sure it would be a very nice vice. But my advice is to get on eBay and get a Thompson Model A like I did. It's a perfectly serviceable vice. It's well made. It's a quality piece of gear, and it was 30 bucks. So you get your vice on eBay, 
Uh, I found, I looked yesterday, I found new old stock Thompson Model A's uh, under 40 bucks shipped. The barrier to entry is low with this vice. Does it have special midge jaws or rotary functions or thread holders or does it have a clock on it? No, it doesn't. It just holds the hook steady while you tie. The rest of the stuff we can buy new at an outlet like J. Stockard Fly Fishing, which is how I priced all this out. I'm going to put links in the description below to everything that is in my budget here. Uh, so if you just want to, you can buy all that stuff and be set for a hundred bucks. It's the vice that you gotta, you know, you gotta buy that separately. But next up, you're gonna need some good scissors. Don't scrimp on the scissors. I budgeted 20 bucks for scissors. That's how important, 20% uh, of the entire cost. That's how important scissors are. Uh, these are TMCOs. I've had them three years now. They're still super sharp. They always cut what I want them to cut. I think they work great. I paid 20 bucks for them. Do you need a hair stacker, a dubbin twister, and a dubbin brush? No. No, and this is why you shouldn't buy the kits. This is this, they come with all these tools you're never gonna use. And come on, a dub and brush, you don't need to pay 10 bucks for a dub and brush. Get a freaking popsicle stick with Velcro glue to it. What do you need? You're gonna need a whip finishing tool. Uh, I priced out the Dr. Slick uh, because I, I don't trust, I, I don't trust the other one. I don't know if they're good or bad, but the other ones that Chase Stockard sells, I have no experience with. So yes, there are cheaper ones. I think this one was $7.95. Um, but I know this one works really well and it's eight bucks. And last but not least for your tools, you're going to need a basic El Cheapo bobbin, uh, to hold your thread. It is uh, five bucks. You can get ceramic inserts. You can get a, yeah, I mean, you can pay 30 bucks for a bobbin if you want to. I don't know why you would want to. So that's it. That's it for the tools. That's it for the gear. You just got to buy the materials. Let's get started on that. There's one more difficult item on this list. Everybody likes to get super specific about their materials, and I generally think that most materials work just fine, uh, substituting materials for different purposes on flies. However, I'm gonna get really specific on this. You need strung rooster saddle hackles. These are made by Wopsy. I got these for $4.59 from Orlando Outfitters, um, but Jay Stocker doesn't carry them. So you gotta source them from somewhere else uh, when you buy them, you can buy just one pack and stay in budget here. I would suggest buying several packs. Um, and I can, I will put like, uh, item numbers in the description below. Um, but it's important to get these in natural ginger and they're made by Wopsy. They come in all sorts of different colors. Natural ginger is the color you want. Fish won't bite anything else. Next, the creepiest item on our list, we are going to need an actual Hair's mask. What is a hair's mask? It's the face of a freaking rabbit. You can get them whole or half. I think a whole one is five bucks. Uh, they're, um, they're very macabre. But the point of getting this as opposed to dubbin is that you can get all kinds of dubbin out of a single hair's mask as opposed to buying dry fly dubbin or wet fly dubbin or tan dubbin or brown dubbin. You can get all that from snipping away different parts of fur and mixing it together is a super versatile piece of material to have and it, you can get tails for your wet flies out of it. You can, you can get all sorts of stuff out of this. You just have to deal with it looking at you as you're tying your flies. What else is on the list? Not much. You need some gold beads. You need some lead wire. You're going to need some sort of ribbing material. Uh, in this case, I'm using ultra wire in small and it's gold. You're going to need a spool of thread. You can get a nice neutral color like tan, which will match the rest of the fly, or you can go crazy and get a fluorescent yellow or something, which will stand out as a hot spot. Both of these are perfectly valid ways to attract fish. So if you want to, you can go out and buy the Orvis Competition Barbless Tactical Hooks to use on your super cheap, super simple flies. I would like to stay in budget, and uh, for that purpose, I'm using the Umqua U-Series uh, this is model U001. It's a dry fly, standard wire, down eye, 1XL hook. Super simple. Not the sexiest thing ever, but they're $5.95 for $50. Alright, let's get to the flies. The first one is my number one. This is a Tinkara style Adams fly. Uh, and I saw this tied by Jim Mazira. Uh, I'll put a link to his video in the description below. Um, but I've made it a little less Tinkara-like, Tinkara 
and uh, and a little more Western style, but I don't use any of the fancy wings or anything like that. It's just a uh, rooster hackle wing, rooster hackle tail, hair's ear body. This fly is super effective. I've never had uh, another fly perform like this one. It catches fish on top all day long, even when they're not rising. Um, when it, Normally it floats like a battleship, but when it does go under, it gets even better. It catches fish even better under the surface, just sort of floating in the film. Uh, if you pulse it back towards you, uh, the hackle fluctuates and fish just go crazy for that. If I could fish with only one fly, this would be the one. So the second fly is my second most productive fly, and it's uh, my most productive subsurface fly. This one I usually hang off a dropper uh, beneath the atoms, and uh, you could call it a hare's ear, you could call it um, a waltz worm, you could call it a killer bugger, which is usually what I call it, uh, or you could call it, I guess, a, um, you know, a micro woolly bugger. Uh, it kind of fits the shape and pattern of all those things. Most importantly, it's really, really buggy. It has a lot of action in the water, and with the bead and lead wraps, it gets down deep. So we're going to tie both these flies on the same hooks with the same materials, thereby reaching peak economy, and we're going to do it all for that initial $100 investment so that you will save money within your first 50 flies. Let's go. So we're going to choose a feather from our ginger pack of saddle hackles uh, that is long and slender. And we're going to use every piece of this feather. We're going to use the fluffy part at the bottom. We're going to use these long spikes down here. And mostly we're going to use the rest of the feather. So we're going to start each of our flies by mashing the barb in the jaws of our tying vise. The barb on our cheapo dry fly hooks because we couldn't afford the competition barbless style. Uh, and then we're going to place the hook for our dry fly into the barb, securing it tightly with the hook shank roughly parallel to the floor. Now you want to measure the barbs of your specially selected feather against the hook gap. And the correct barbs are those which are about twice the length of the hook gap. So you can mark that spot with your fingers, preen the feather back from there, and either snip it off or break it. Now we're ready to start. Get your thread loaded into your bobbin there and take the first wrap around your finger so you've got some leverage on the thread. Start at a 45 degree angle just behind the hook eye and then it'll slip a little bit but you'll get the hang of it. Wrap the thread back on itself while bracing the hook since it is a dry fly hook it's going to be a little a little flimsy. Wrap all the way back to the bend of the hook. So now you take your special feather, you find the barbs that are too long to be useful as part of the wing, and you snip those guys off. Those barbs will become the tail of our fly, and so we're going to choose a measurement that's about two-thirds of a hook shank in length. Transfer that to the other hand, take a big loose wrap just to get it uh, collected there, and now pull up on the tail as you lash the rest of the feather down and it'll keep the, uh, the feather on top of the hook and then snip the rest off. Yes, it's a little messy, don't worry, we're gonna cover it up. So move your thread forward and then back to a point just behind the eye, maybe an eye length behind the eye. And from here, place your gold wire on the near side of the hook and go ahead and with loose wraps, tie it in and then bind it down like so. Pull up at the end, make sure it doesn't interfere with the tail and wrap back to that tie in point, maybe an eye length behind the eye. Now for the important part, we grab our feather uh, and in your offhand preen away uh, the bottom two or three barbs maybe four or five barbs there and we're going to use that stem to secure the feather with a big loose wrap at first and then we bind down the rest of the stem a lot of people when they're tying tinkara style reverse hackle flies they'll tie with one side of the feather either the dark side or the light side i don't know if you guys can see that uh, they'll tie it concave or convex so facing forward facing i don't i don't care i just tie it in as well as i can and then i grab the feather and start taking tight wraps around the hook 
and transfer it to my left hand. Every time I transfer it, I preen the hackle forward a little bit. So that way I don't have to worry about the orientation. And ideally, you'd like to get super close spiral wraps of this feather. The goal here is to get all the barbs that you possibly can onto the wing of this fly so that it will float really well in the water. And it takes some patience. Finally, pull the stem back and secure your feather. Snip the remainder off. If there's any errant fibers, you can either sweep them forward and do another couple of wraps to hold them that way, or you can snip them off, or you can just not worry about them. The fish don't care. Now wrap your thread back to the tail. Now using our hair's mask, we're gonna prepare two piles of dubbin. The first we'll use our fingers for, and we're gonna reach in here and grab the under fur, literally the fur, under the fur, and pluck it out until we have a nice little pile. Now, as you can see, this stuff is light and fine and fluffy. As a, uh, uh oh. Okay, so we've got the fine fluffy stuff there with a little bit of dirt and used motor oil for Mojo. And here's the shorter, spikier, heavier, darker stuff from another part of the hair's mask. And this is what we use for our wet fly. Now, wash your hands, because you're gonna need to lick your finger and get a tiny bit of that dry fly dubbin we set aside earlier and thread it on to your tying thread with a counterclockwise motion. This takes some practice. Uh, you won't get it quickly, uh, but stick with it. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter if you do it right. Um, this fly is supposed to look a little lumpy. And the goal is to build a little bit of a taper, a carrot shape uh, that gets thicker toward the head of the fly. Uh, if you don't pull off the carrot shape perfectly, that's okay. Uh, and I don't think the fish care at all. Plenty of people tie flies like this with only thread bodies. They leave the dubbin out entirely. But I think with a little bit of floatance, uh, it helps the fly float. And you leave just a tiny bit of space right behind the wing. Now you grab your gold wire and make open spiral wraps up top, like so. Take a couple of turns behind the wire to secure it, like that. And then using your fingernail, hold the wire down, twist it till it comes loose. Now you grab your whip finishing tool and do a double four turn whip finish. But Gribs, what about head cement? Head cement is for sissies. You've got a double four turn whip finish. That's basically eight knots. It's gonna look messy here. And I like that. But if you don't like those errant fibers, when you snip your thread off, you can just kind of use that opportunity to get in there and snip some of those really buggy dry fly or uh, really buggy hair's ear uh, fibers out that don't befit a dry fly. And you're done. There is the, uh, the Gribbly Adams. Now it's time to tie the wet fly and we're gonna start in much the same way by mashing the barb in the jaws of our vise, like so. This is the hard part. After you get your uh, barb mashed, you're gonna thread on the gold bead small hole first. See, look at that, I made it look easy. And now secure the hook. In your vise. Before we start the thread, we're going to grab our lead wire, in this case 0 0.020, and we're going to put 11 wraps around this hook. Here we again take a couple of wraps around our index finger to hold the thread on there, and we build a little lump of thread behind the lead to keep it secure and stuffed up into the bead, and then tie back the short distance to the bend of the hook, pluck it off. So now we have to make a decision about the tail material that we're going to use for our wet flies. The traditional hare's ear uses a tail of hare's ear fur. Uh, but we can also use the long barbs from our feathers to give it a little bit more of a realistic mayfly tail. Or, if you're feeling really brave, you can use the soft fuzzy part of the bottom of the feather 
to give it a marabou woolly bugger like tail. It's entirely up to you. I'm going to tie the traditional hare's ear version, uh, but I believe that the uh, the barbed version is more realistic. And oh man. And the marabou version is probably most effective because it has the best action in the water. Plus it's just sexy as hell. The proper fibers on a hare's mask to make the hare's ear tail come from the base of the ear, thus the name hare's ear, and you need such a small amount that I can't even really show you how to cut it off. Um, but, but, but basically, you grab the smallest pinch you possibly can, snip it with your scissors, and throw half of it away. Now, as you can see, our tail material is very fine and hard to work with. Uh, so we'll grab it as quickly as, I, as we can without losing anything and go ahead and take a loose collecting wrap. Maybe another one just because it's fine for, yeah, that's about a good length for the tail, about half the uh, length of the hook shank. Bind it down really well and even then some fibers are going to come loose. Now using that space, so you've, you've wrapped all the way back to the tail there, using that space Hold your gold wire against the near side of the hook shank. Bind it down really well as well. And that way, the mass of the tail and of the wire uh, brings our thickness even with the lead wraps, makes the fly look less bumpy. Now we are pretty much home free, wrap back to the tail. Careful not to jostle it there. Now, grab a pinch of the very spiky dubbin you collected from the other parts of the hair's mask. This stuff is a little harder to work with, um, and that's why we mix it together and bind it in with the really fine stuff. Um, so do your best to get this on the hook, and I find uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the wet flies, um, doing this a little bit at a time, and not trying to build a big dubbin rope, just get a few inches at a time on there. Not only does it make the process a little more pleasant, but uh, it builds a finer taper. And there's no rule that says you can't go back and take a wrap where you missed a spot. Uh, fibers are gonna come free. That's okay, just uh, put them back in the little pile of dubbing you got going. Now, you think, you think you've got enough on there. Um, but then, when you wrap your wire, it's going to mush some of it down and give it a segmented look. That's good. But when you get to the end and you secure that wire with a couple of wraps behind the bead, it kind of takes away the taper part of your taper. So we're going to do the same thing we did last time. Hold that down with your thumbnail, helicopter it off. And now, after we've got the wire secured, we're going to add a pinch or two more uh, dub into the very front of the fly right behind the bead. Like so. Another double four turn whip finish. Two, three, four. And you might need to add a little more dubbing as you're doing that, but I think this one's going to be okay uh, between, the, uh, between the two whip finishes. And uh, one, two, three, four. Now you think we're done. We're almost there. We're going to snip off our thread. This time we really want all those buggy fibers, so leave them alone. And in fact, the finishing touch is to come in with our Velcro laden popsicle stick and we just rough it up real good. We just, we just we ruin its day. We just mess it up, bring out all those fibers from behind that gold wrap. And this thing now looks like a hot fish catching mess. So there you have it. You are now a capable fly tire and you have two patterns, at least in your box, for under a hundred dollars. Now you can go search out those rare North Missoula hobag trout bass whisker tailed rooster fish. I don't know what you want to search out, but I think these flies can do it. Thank you so much for watching. I had a lot of fun making this video. I hope you have tight lines and keep the ends out for the ties that bind.